talk is about Haxel. So to let me uh, set the scene just to start, we're going to talk about I.O. today mainly. So you've heard lots of things about beautiful functional programming uh, during this conference so far, but sooner or later we have to write programs that interact with the real world, and that means doing some kind of I.O. Um, but I.O. gets really messy, and it has a bunch of problems. So some of these problems, first of all, it tends to be quite slow. For example, fetching data from a remote server is much slower than fetching data from local memory. There are lots of ways in which I.O. tends to be slower than doing local things. Uh, and that means that we don't want our programs to be waiting around for the I.O. to finish. So we try and overlap the I.O. as much as possible. Or maybe we try and batch it together and do it in, in a single batch. Um, but in some way, we need to do some kind of concurrency to avoid our I.O. taking too long. The second problem is that I.O. tends to be hard to test. That's because if you do I.O. again, you might not get the same results that you got the first time. The I.O. is in interacting with the real world. The real world changes underneath your feet. Um, the results that you get will be different because you know, the, the world has changed. Uh, so that means constructing a repeatable test case can be quite challenging. The third problem is that it's hard to debug when something goes wrong. That's because the conditions that existed at the time when you did the I.O. might not exist again. You might not be able to reproduce exactly what happened uh, when the I.O. failed. So that, that makes it hard to, to debug exactly what happened. Maybe you're trying to debug something that happened on a customer's machine or happened in, in production a while ago, and the same thing doesn't go wrong in the same way anymore. So these problems might not seem related. And in fact, it was quite a surprise to me that they're actually related. Because I was working on a solution to the first problem, and the solution I ended up with happened to help with the second two problems. So this is, is kind of a surprise to me. And hopefully you'll find it interesting. But maybe you're thinking, Simon, what are you talking about? These are all trivial things. I, I do these, these things all the time. I, I know how to do concurrency. I know how to test my code. And I know how to debug problems when they happen. And that's absolutely right. You're, you're, you're quite right. Um, for example, every language has some way of doing concurrency. So here are a few examples of, of uh, languages that you might have used. Uh, in Python, we've got asynchronous I.O. JavaScript has an asynchronous thing. Haskell, we've got lightweight threads and various abstractions around those. C++ has you know, various different things, including futures, as I've illustrated here. Um, so these are all good ways of overlapping I.O., in particular the asynchronous, uh, sort of async await style APIs that we see quite a lot these days are very good ways of, of overlapping I.O. without going all the way to having heavyweight threads. So these are very, very popular. Um, and that's all very well, but there's a bunch of problems here. So first of all, I have to remember to do it. So I've got to go and look at my program and notice the, the things that I can overlap safely, and I've got to write something explicitly in my program that does that. And even if you do it, there are ways that you can still go wrong. So if you await too early for a result before you actually need it, then you're limiting the amount of concurrency that you can actually exploit in the program. Uh, and nothing's going to actually go wrong if you do this. You know, you're just going to get a program that's slightly less efficient than it could be. And then someone comes along later on to refactor your code, and they change the dependencies between things. And now the things you can do concurrently before can't be done concurrently anymore. And you know, maybe the, there are opposite things where you can do more concurrency than you could have done before. So you have to go and fix all those awaits and then re refactor everything. And when you've done that, concurrency is, is clustering the code. So it's still uh, it, it's obscuring the functionality that you are trying to express clearly with the code you're writing. Uh, and in fact, even doing the refactoring is just harder because you've got this extra structure. You've got this extra grouping and uh, the, the dependencies of obscuring um, or, or making it hard to, to refactor the code purely due to functionality. But I'm, I'm sure you're probably thinking, well, this is here for a reason. We have to do explicit concurrency because there are these things called side effects. And if I was to just overlap everything arbitrarily, things would go wrong because you know, now my side effects happen in a non-deterministic order, and I can't tell what's going on in my program anymore. And yes, that, that's absolutely true. But what about the parts of my program where there are no side effects, or where I'm, I'm not very sensitive to the ordering in which things happen? 
And in fact, that happens quite a lot. So in our programs, we often do things where we're gathering some data. Maybe we're fetching data from, from a remote database or other services. Then we're making some decisions based on that data. Then maybe we fetch some more data and we make some more decisions. And finally, we take some action. So this is a common sort of pattern that you see. And one of the places that this very commonly happens is, for example, in uh, generating a web page. So the user makes a request to the web server. The web server goes and consults various databases, other services, caching services, whatever. Uh, and then it generates some HTML and sends that back to the user. So this is all you know, fairly side effect free. I'm, I'm not going to say absolutely side effect free, because technically speaking, fetching data from a database is a side effect, because the database might actually change. right? Um, but usually, you don't really mind about that. Uh, if you really do mind about that, then you probably should be using a database where you can fetch a, a consistent snapshot and then make multiple queries against that snapshot. But most of us don't use that kind of database. So we, we're just happy to make multiple queries and as, assume that everything is fine. Uh, so I'm going, to, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to ignore the problem. And I'm also going to try and reduce the problem as much as, much as possible by caching things. So I'm going to cache requests uh, so that if I make the same request again, I'll get the same result, and I'm not going to be affected by data changing. So the main claim I want to make here about concurrency is that in the parts of your program where you're insensitive to things running in a different order, when there are essentially no side effects that you're worried about, then concurrency is a better default to be working with. And I'll give you some illustrations as to how that might work. But before I do that, let's go back to the other problems that I mentioned. So how do we test our I.O. code? How do you test your I.O. code? I don't know about you, but I, I often just try it a couple of times, and if it looks like it's working, then that's, that's pretty good. And maybe when I'm writing my, uh, writing my code and sending it out for review, maybe the test plan I write is that it works once on my machine, and that's, uh, that's about the best that I can do. Uh, well, is it the best you can do? How can we actually make a reliable test, given that the world is changing underneath our I.O.? Well, one thing that you can do is to have a special part of the world that you reserve just for testing, maybe a little part that you don't worry too much about. Um, and this is all very well, but there's a few things that we have to rely on for this to work. So first of all, we've got to rely on the fact that this little bit of the world that we're using for testing is representative enough of the rest of the world so that our test is actually testing something that we care about. Secondly, we have to make sure that the world is actually working because we're using the real world, albeit a small part of it, to test our code. Uh, and the third thing we have to worry about is that the test might not just touch this small part of the world that we've reserved for testing. It might accidentally go and touch another part of the world, and that would be bad. So this is not an ideal solution. So maybe we could have some kind of fake world. We could have an alternative world that we're going to use just for testing our code on. And this has to pretend to be exactly like the real world. And this is what we often call a mock API, a, a substitute for the side-effecting parts of our program or the parts that interact with the world. Uh, and the mock will just replace that API with one that, that's going to return results from an internal database or, or something, instead of talking to the real world. But somehow we have to populate our mock API with some test data, and we have to get some test data from somewhere. So you can write it manually. That tends to be quite hard. Uh, there's quite a lot of work involved in doing that. Um, sometimes what we try and do is to record the interaction with the real world when we run the test for real, and you know, capture that recording and place that in our mock API so that the mock API behaves exactly like the real world did at the time when we recorded the data. And that's fine, but we have to build up lots of infrastructure to make that work. And it tends to be different depending on the different kinds of I.O. that we're doing. So we might have to solve this problem multiple times. And this is often what we do when we really care about it. You know, if, you, if you're writing a system that needs to be heavily tested, that needs to be working, we're willing to go to quite a lot, a lot of effort to make sure it's tested well. Uh, so we might build a mock API. Um, but I want it to be easier than that. 
I want my mock APIs just to exist, just to, uh, to exist for very little effort. So what about debugging? Let's go back to this problem about debugging. What happened when something went wrong in production and now I've got to figure out how this thing went wrong and, and what the problem was? And I can't just run it again because now the world has changed and it won't behave in the same way. So one thing we often do to address this problem is to do lots and lots of logging. You know, we, we write out data, um, uh, perhaps in production, perhaps to a log on the customer's machine, whatever, uh, in some way that we can get this logging data back after the failure has happened and inspect the log to try and find out what happened. Well, that's not a great solution to the problem either. Again, you have to remember to do it. So you've got to remember to put logging in the right places in your code. You've got to anticipate the kind of things that might fail. You've got to log all the stuff that will uh, let you inspect it later on and diagnose it. And often you might not log enough stuff. You might forget to log something. And then when the failure happens, you inspect the log. There's not enough in there to diagnose what the problem was. You've got to go back, add more logging, hope the failure happens again, and then hopefully you'll be able to diagnose it the second time. Uh, and hopefully you don't have to do that too many times in order to diagnose the problem. And then finally, all this logging actually clutters the code. And you've got to make sure that everything is printable uh, and you know, you've got all these logging statements interspersed with the actual functionality. So this is not an ideal solution. What I want is to somehow just let me reproduce exactly what happened. When the failure happens, I want to get the failure and I want to get enough ex extra metadata somehow that will let me reproduce exactly what happened and to diagnose it. So let me digress just a little bit and talk about big hammers. So the idea of a big hammer is some kind of technology or library or abstraction that solves an important problem, one or more problems sometimes, and it really solves these problems for good. And these big hammers tend to have a common characteristic, which is that you have to go to some effort to adopt it. Okay, so you maybe have to write some boilerplate, or you maybe have to change your workflow. Or in some way, you have to you know, make a conscious decision and, uh, and put some effort into actually adopting uh, the technology. So let me give you an example of the kind of things that I'm talking about. Distributed source control is what we would call a big hammer, I think. Uh, I come from a time before we had distributed source control where we used to email patches to each other on mailing lists and we used to uh, you know, manually patch our local copies of the source code and it was very difficult to synchronize with other people working on, on their own branches of development. Nowadays we take that very much for granted that we can look at other people's branches, we can merge those branches, we can, uh, we, we can exchange changes very, very easily. So that's really revolutionized, revolutionized the way that we do distributed uh, development, collaborative development. Another thing is, is garbage collection. So garbage collection addresses the problem of memory management. It makes the, the problem of memory, memory management from the programmer's point of view almost go away. Well, maybe it gives it to the JVM team at your company. But from the programmer's point of view, they don't have to worry about memory management. Uh, so that really helps the productivity of your, your developers. Language independent RPC. So this is something that is very, very useful if you're uh, writing code in a, in a heterogeneous environment where you want to have different components of your system written in different languages. So you want to use a language that's the best tool for the job. Um, so you have different components in, in different languages, but they want to talk about a common data type or they want to talk to a common service. So you write the specification for that service in a language independent way, and then you can compile that specification into serializers and deserializers or you know, services, clients and, and servers for that service. So it just lets you choose the right tool for the job in different parts of your system. Uh, and that's a, a really good generalization. So where I'm going with this is that the, the framework that I'm talking about, Haxel, has the characteristics of a big hammer. I don't want to be too presumptuous and say that it's you know, on, on the same level as garbage collection or source control, but uh, Haxel has some of the same characteristics. It's going to solve a problem 
namely concurrency, and also help with testing and debugging. Uh, and you're going to have to go to some effort in order to use it. So Haxel is a Haskell library, uh, and it provides an abstraction over concurrent I.O. It also works in conjunction with something that we implemented in the compiler, in the Haskell compiler, called the applicative do extension. So I'll talk a bit about what that is shortly. But let me give you an example. So the example I've chosen is a script that you might write in a kind of DevOps type setting. So the script is going to, uh, the idea is that we have software installed on a bunch of machines somewhere. And we want to update that software to the latest version. And the machines running the software might not all be running the same version of the software. So we're going to have to interrogate each of the machines on the network to find out which version of the software it has. And then for those machines which are running an outdated version of the software, we're going to update those machines. So we'll need a few operations to do this. And the, this is the API that I'm going to be working with. So get latest version is an operation that returns a version. So you can see the type on the right here. This is a Haskell type signature with the type on the right. The type says it's a Haxel computation. Haxel is the framework that we're using. And when you see a type that has Haxel in it like that, it means that this computation may do some data fetching. Or it may do some I.O. underneath. It may fail. Uh, but in the end, it's going to return a version if it returns. The second operation is get hosts. So this is going to interrogate some state somewhere and return the list of hosts that we have on the network. Get installed version is a function that takes a host and it's a computation that returns a version. So it's going to interrogate that host to find out which version of the software it has available and return that version. Update to is an operation that takes two arguments. It takes a version to update to. It takes a host on which to, which to apply the updates. And it returns no arguments. This one is actually a side effect. It's really going to update the software on that machine. So here's what our script looks like. So it's a do expression in Haskell. And do introduces a list of statements. So the first statement is going to get the latest version. Just call that operation, get latest version and bind that to the variable latest. Next, we're going to get the hosts and bind that to the variable hosts. Next, we're going to interrogate each of those hosts to find out which in installed version of the software it has. And to do that, we'll use the mapm function from Haskell. So mapm takes a function, which is a, a computation, and it applies that function to all of the elements of the list in the second argument. So it's calling get installed version for each of the elements of the the list hosts that we got on the second statement. And it returns a list of the installed versions for those hosts. So next, we have to construct a list of all the hosts that we need to update. And that list is going to contain all of the hosts for which the version installed on that machine is less than the latest version. So this is a list comprehension in Haskell. It's a list of H such that we get pairs of H and V by zipping the two lists, hosts and installed. And if V is less than latest, then we will put H in the result list. Finally, now that we have our list of hosts to update, we can call mapm. The underscore here means that we throw away the result. We don't care about the result. And we're applying the update to function applied to the latest version to each of those hosts that we got from this list comprehension. OK, so this is just really a straightforward sequence of operations, just a, uh, really a recipe for what it means to update all these hosts to the latest version. But clearly, some parts of this script could run in parallel. Which parts? Let's look at the dependency graph of what's going on here. So from the start, we can do both get hosts and get latest version, because there were no dependencies between those two statements. So we could definitely do those two things in parallel. Next, we could also do all of the get installed version operations in parallel. They were part of a map. We were mapping that operation over all the hosts. So the map is completely independent. and We could do all of those in parallel for sure. Finally, when we have the list of hosts to update and we have the latest version that we need to update to, we can do all of the do up update operations in parallel too. <coughs> 
And the nice thing is that if you run this script as is, with Haxel and with this compiler extension that I mentioned, Haxel will actually execute it according to this dependency graph. So it will exploit all the parallelism that's, that's inherent in the dependencies between the statements. So how does that work? Well, data dependencies determine the ordering. The compiler is going to analyze the dependencies between those statements and use that to determine which order we, can do, we do things in and which things can be done concurrently. We didn't have to write any explicit concurrency constructs. So the programmer doesn't have to write any async, await, future, any of that sort of stuff. The concurrency is just inherent in the dependencies. And we just wrote the obvious code. So you might use this for simple scripts like this where you wouldn't probably go to a lot of effort to make sure things were optimally concurrent. If you can get concurrency for free, why wouldn't you do it? So I'll draw a conclusion, uh, uh, um, draw a comparison between Haxel and garbage collection here. So garbage collection is abstracting away from memory management. And in a similar way, Haxel is abstracting away from concurrency. And neither of these things give you the optimal solution. So if you're prepared to do your own memory management, right, if you're writing C++, you can do a very finely tuned job of memory management um, and do better than a garbage collector would be able to do. But then if you use the garbage collector, you can get 80 or 90% of the way there for no effort. And Haxel is a similar, similar kind of situation where if you're prepared to do the scheduling yourself, you can probably do a better job than Haxel would. But Haxel is going to get most of the way there without you having to do anything. So to put it in a slightly different way, we just change the default. So instead of things running strictly sequentially, things are going to run concurrent concurrently where, where, where possible, where the dependencies allow it. And this makes a lot of sense in the parts of your program where concurrency is the right default. So those parts where you're insensitive to the reordering of things and you don't mind if things get happen, uh, things happening uh, concurrently. So how does it actually work? Well, the main problem that we have to address here is that Data dependencies are not first-class things in the language that you can talk about in a library. So I can't, I can't write a library that talks about the dependencies between two statements in a do expression. I'm going to need some kind of compiler support in order to be able to do that. But we don't want to build Haxel. We don't want to build anything specific about the way that we do concurrency into the compiler. So we have to search for a more general solution to this problem. So here's an example, going back to our example earlier. We have these two statements get latest version and get hosts. And these two things are completely independent, but we can only know that by looking at the names of the variables and seeing where those variables occur in the statements. So the compiler has to get involved here. But the way the compiler deals with this expression is that it treats it as syntactic sugar. If you go look in the Haskell report, it tells you what the definition of the do expression is in terms of syntactic sugar. And it expands literally into this expression here where we're using the monad bind operator, this greater than, greater than, equals operator, to combine the statements. So at the top here, we've got get latest version, and that's the left-hand argument to bind, and the right-hand argument is a function from the variable latest, which gets bound to the result of get latest version, and then we do get host, and that gets bound, and so forth. So this is how monads work. Every monad provides a different implementation for this operator. And that's how the do, do notation works with different monads and provides different behavior depending on the monad you're using. But we've already lost at this point if we allow that to be the desugaring of our do expression. And that's because the monad bind operator, from its type, we can tell that it's already sequential because the first argument to bind is a computation that returns an A. And the A that we get back from this computation is passed to the function, that's the second argument to bind. So interestingly, this almost this exact same slide appeared in a talk yesterday, in, in Daniel's talk about IO and Scala, and he was pointing out that this is a good thing because IO enforces sequentiality, and here I'm saying that this is a bad thing because IO enforces sequentiality, which is bad if what you want is concurrency. Um, but the so the main point here is that 
uh, sequentiality is, is a fact of life of, of, of monads. It, it's embodied in the type of the bind operator. So this is really the sequential combination operator. And once we've done this degrading, it can only be sequential. We can't go back from here and in, infer any kind of concurrency at all. So we need to use a slightly different abstraction. Unfortunately, Haskell provides this abstraction called applicative. So applicative has an operator that we call app, or sometimes splat, this angle bracket star operator. And it combines things in a way that can be concurrent given a suitable implementation. And Haxel is going to provide that implementation. So why is this concurrent, or why is it able to be concurrent? It's because the type of the app operator takes two computations, but they have no dependencies between them. The first computation that it takes returns a function from A to B, and the second computation returns an A. And finally, after both of these computations have taken place, we apply the function that we got from the first argument to the argument that we got from the second argument. And finally, we get a B. So the difference here between monad and applicative is that to run the second computation of the monad, we needed the value from the first argument. Whereas with applicative, we can run the two computations and then we combine their results. And the two computations can run concurrently. And this is all very well, but I don't want to write this stuff by hand. Okay, it's a little bit complicated. The, the operators are perhaps a bit obscure, but that's, that's not the real problem. The real problem is that I've had to do something explicit. I've had to look at my program, figure out what I can do concurrently, and you know, group those things together using applicative. And that's exactly what I didn't want to do. I wanted this to happen automatically. So this is where the compiler comes in and the extension that we added to the compiler called applicative do. So applicative do takes one of these do expressions and it analyzes the dependencies between the statements and it, instead of doing that simple desugaring that we saw earlier on where we just use the monad bind operator, it will use the applicative operator where it can. And that's not necessarily everywhere because in the places where we have real dependencies between statements, we will have to use bind. But in the places where we have no dependencies, we can use a, the applicative operator, and this will enable whatever is implementing these operators to behave in a concurrent way. And in particular, the Haxel library is going to implement this operator, the app operator, uh, to provide concurrency. And maybe you're wondering, how exactly does it do that? Well, I'm not going to go into details about how the implementation actually works, but what it looks like from the user's point of view, the user of the Haxel library, is that you get to see a whole bunch of I.O. that you can execute concurrently. So your job as somebody who is using the Haxel library is to implement this function called fetch, and fetch gets passed by Haxel a list of things that you can do concurrently. And in this case, I probably have some operations like get latest version and get hosts, and fetch will get past these two operations. And it's the job of fetch here, the job of your implementation of fetch, to return the results of those operations. And it can implement that in whatever way you, you deem appropriate. You, know, you, could, you could fork threads, or you could uh, use asynchrony underneath. You can use whatever method you want to. Maybe you batch these things together and send them off to a single server, or whatever. Uh, but what Haxel is doing for you is it's telling you which things you can do concurrently by executing the program. If you think about this in a kind of a dependency graph way, the, the, the computation that you're running evolves into a tree-like structure where the branches in this tree are created by the applicative operator. Every time we use applicative, we can go down two branches. And if you explore this computation tree, you will get to a whole set of, uh, of I.O. operations, the yellow blobs that I've used in this diagram here. So Haxel explores the tree, it finds all the things that it can do concurrently, the I.O. operations, and it performs them all at the same time, in what we call a round. So round one is where we performed all these yellow blobs here. And then when those results are available, then they unblock further parts of the computation and we can explore more of the tree. And then perhaps we'll find some more I.O. Uh, 
And this process repeats. If we do a round of I.O., we do some more computation, and we keep on doing this until the whole thing is finished and we have the answer at the end. So taking away the tree, it looks like this. We do computation, we do some I.O., we do some more computation, we do some more I.O., and so forth. But one problem with doing it this way is what happens when one of our I.O. items ends up to be very expensive, much more expensive than the others. So the difference between this and this is that we're now doing the computation much later, the second round of computation much later than we would have done if they were all the same size. So this is not making the best use of the resources that we have because we're waiting for just one thing to finish. And perhaps we could have done some more computation that depended only on these bits of the I.O. So that's one limitation in the way that we've done this. But this limitation is kind of inherent sometimes in the code that we write. So I want to go back to this example that I had earlier on with this script. And it turns out that this is not the best way I could have written it. Because what's happened here is that I'm mapping the get installed version over this list of hosts. So I have to get back this full list of installed things before I can go on to the next step and do the updates. And perhaps a better way that I could have written it is like this, where I've here made a local function called per host. This takes a host as an argument. It does the get installed version call for that host. And then it makes the decision about whether to do the update to. And finally, it does the update to if necessary. So here I'm, I'm kind of refactoring the way that we, we're doing the, the operations, which gives rise to a slightly different graph. Instead of this dependency graph, now it will look something like this. So now I have, uh, for each of the hosts, I'm calling get installed version, and the result of that is going down into the do update. And I'm not going to do do update for all of the hosts. Some of them don't need updating but only the ones that need updating will get the final do update operation. And the other thing to notice here is that the get latest version operation, the result of that gets sent down to each of the do update operations down here because, so I need the latest version here in order to decide whether to do the update to. So, just pulling that apart a little bit. I now get all of these concurrent subgraphs for each of the separate hosts. And this would work out quite nicely if maybe one of the hosts took a little while to respond. And this get installed version takes a bit longer than the others. And now maybe I can do some of these do updates earlier. So you can't do that with Haxel as I described it up to now, where we're doing these individual rounds. But we've been working on a new version of Haxel that we call Haxel 2, and this drops the requirements for all the concurrent uh, I.O. has to happen in a single round. So now the I.O. can be arbitrarily overlapped, and it can be overlapped with computation as well. So uh, it just changes the, the requirements so that you don't have to finish all of the I.O. before you can go on and do the next lots of computation. And this means that we have to have a new contract with the I.O. provider. So before I talked about this fetch call that has to, uh, takes all of the I.O. that you can do and then returns all the results. And now we have to have a slightly different contract. So instead of just passing all the I.O. to the fetch function, we're passing uh, a set of pairs where the left-hand component of the pair is the I.O. that we want to do, and the right-hand component is a variable into which we can send the result. So it's the job of the I.O. provider here to perform the I.O., perhaps in the background, and then later on, you know, fill in this, this result var with the result. And this will have the effect of unblocking whatever computation was waiting for that result. Um, so this gives rise to one slightly interesting trade-off, because so before, when I ran all the I.O., uh, or rather, when I, when I wait for all the I.O., I can maximally batch all that I.O. together. So I can look at all the places where I'm sending I.O. to the same place, 
and I have the opportunity to batch all that into a single request, if that's beneficial. But now I've got I.O. happening at different times, possibly overlapped in arbitrary ways, and I probably don't want to wait for all the I.O. to arrive before I, I send it off. So I've got this trade-off between how much batching I can possibly e exploit uh, against latency. Because if, if I decide not to wait for all the I.O., then I perhaps get more laten uh, lower latency, but I get less batching. Um, so Haxel2 lets you trade off this, uh, these two opportunities. Um, when we deployed this in production, uh, our service at Facebook, we actually saw latency reductions. So some of the requests that we were doing had dependencies that allowed Haxel2 to do, to do a better scheduling of the I.O. and actually reduce the latency. Um, so the batching trade-off trade turned out to be in our favor. Haxel2 right now is available on GitHub. Uh, actually, not quite available on Hackage. I haven't released it on Hackage yet, but it it's, will be there very shortly. So just to recap what we, what we saw here, we, we had this example where there was lots of inherent parallelism in the code. But the, the code didn't expose all of the parallelism. In order to squeeze out the last uh, bits of parallelism, in order to, to be able to take advantage of the, uh, the maximum amount of overlapping, we had to refactor the code slightly. So this is kind of reinforcing what I said about it, it's, not, it's not gonna give you the optimal solution. So Haxel isn't going to exploit all of the possible concurrency that you have. But it's gonna get you most of the way there, 80 or 90% perhaps. Uh, and then probably you can go back and profile or analyze your code and find the places where you can squeeze out a little bit more. So I talked at the beginning of the talk about testing and debugging. So let's go back and talk about those again. So in order to use Haxel for your I.O., you have to write a little bit of boilerplate. For each of the different kinds of I.O., you have to write a data type. So here's an example of a data type that you might write for an HTTP request. So this is how you introduce a data type in Haskell. HTTP is the constructor. This is the argument, the request. And it's annotated with the type of its result. So it's an HTTP request that returns a text result. And then when you've written this data type, you have to add some boilerplate instances. This lets Haxel do its stuff. And you have to implement the fetch function, which tells Haxel how to go ahead and just um, and execute your, your request and return the result. So now what we've done is made all of our I.O. into data. And data is very malleable. You can do lots of things with data. This is gonna give us some nice benefits. So Haxel stores all of the I.O. requests and results into an internal cache. That means that when you request the same thing again, if you do the same I.O. again, it compares what you're trying to do, because it's data, against what's already in the cache, and it will give you back the results straight away. And that's very good, obviously, for performance. It's also good for, for correctness if the data changed underneath you, if a database is changing behind you, then you won't notice the changes until you run a new request, because this cache is going to be per request only. It also has some nice benefits of modularity, which might be a little bit of a surprise. So how does this help with modularity? Well, in the absence of caching, if you are fetching the same thing in multiple parts of your program, what you would probably want to do is to find those parts of the program where you're fetching the same data and extract that higher up into your program, you know, fetch the results just once, and then pass those results around to the different parts of your program. But if you have caching, you just don't have to do that. So if you have caching, you can just fetch data wherever you like, or just do I.O. wherever you like, and not worry too much about doing the same thing in multiple places, because it's going to be automatically cached. So this means these two components, which would have had to be coupled if I had no caching, can now be completely decoupled. So the cache records all of the I.O., and the I.O. is the only thing that's actually non-deterministic in the program. Everything else is deterministic. So given that I've cached all the I.O., if I go and run the same program again, I'm guaranteed to get exactly the same answer. All right? And we're going to ensure that you do this for all the I.O., and the Haskell type system lets us prevent you from doing any uh, nefarious I.O. in your program. 
So once you've done this for all your I.O., we can go ahead and print out the cache. So Haskell provides this operation called dump cache as Haskell. So we can print out the cache as a Haskell program. And now if you run this Haskell program, the effect of running this program is to populate the cache with the same requests and responses that we saw the first time. So perhaps you can see where I'm going with this. If we've populated the cache with the same requests and responses that we had the first time, and then we run the code again, we're guaranteed to get the same results, which is basically a unit test. So to make a unit test, you run the code, capture the cache, put the cache in a file, commit the file to your repository, include it in your test code, and you've got a unit test. So that just makes it really, really easy to record and replay data to make unit tests. And this abstraction that we have for populating the cache, which I skipped past, is called cache request. So cache request takes the data item representing the request, it takes the result, and it inserts that item into the cache. So this is the, the basis that you can also use for writing synthetic test data, because you can write functions that create requests and responses, insert those into the cache, and now I can create any kind of uh, synthetic test data that I need to run my test. And it also gives me a handle on this debugging problem that I talked about too. Because now when something goes wrong, if I persist the cache somehow, I have to store the cache, I can you know, log it perhaps. Um, but the programmer has to do nothing specific to any particular kind of failure. As long as they're using this framework, they can persist the cache. And now when the failure happens, they have to look at the cache corresponding to that failure. And they can rerun the code. So you need to know exactly what code was running, obviously. You need to know the input, and you need to have the cache. And now you can reproduce exactly what happened during that failure. And you can see if one of your databases returned an error, you can see what that error was. And then you can see what happened in your code as a response to that failure. So perhaps you're wondering why we made Haxel. Well, there's a blog post you can go look at. This is a few years old now. Um, but Haxel is being used at Facebook at scale to fight various kinds of abuse. We have a rule engine system called Sigma. And Sigma's job is to classify lots of different actions. So when you make an action on Facebook, like you post a message, or you go and click like on something, or you, uh, you, know, you post a status update, something like that, each of these actions has to be classified according to whether it represents some kind of abusive behavior. Uh, and I mentioned here spam. Spam is one of the main kinds of abuse. But there's lots of other kinds of abuse as well, like uh, people um, posting links to websites that have malware on them to try and fish your credentials, you know, all, the, all these bad kinds of things. Uh, so we have a system that tries to classify all of these actions. And the system and the rules are implemented in Haskell, using the Has Haxel framework. And Haxel means that we can have people writing these rules without worrying about concurrency. The rules have to run really fast because they're fetching lots of data from different services in the internal network. But the authors don't have to worry about making sure that the data they're fetching is fetched concurrently. And they get lots of benefits like caching and memoization. So the performance aspects are more or less handled behind the scenes by the Haxel framework. And using Haskell means that we can move very quickly. We can implement new rules very fast because we have a type checker making sure that uh, we're not doing arbitrary I.O. Um, we're not interfering with other rules that already exist in the system. We can add new rules without the worry that they might interfere. And that lets us add new rules very quickly and safely. Just some quick stats. So our, our service is serving over a million requests a second. We have thousands of machines across multiple different data centers around the world. There are hundreds of thousands of lines of code of Haskell. And this has changed at a very rapid pace. We have dozens of people writing code and checking into the, the code base. Hundreds of changes per day. And each of these changes gets deployed almost immediately to the production system. <coughs> Haxel is actually open source. You go to GitHub, you can see it. And as I mentioned, the, the new version of Haxel that we're working on uh, with a new scheduler is visible on GitHub at the moment. So the ideas behind Haxel have become quite popular, and, and so popular, in fact, that there's a whole bunch of different clones of Haxel in different languages. Uh, so if you like Scala, or you like PureScript or Clojure, 
even if you like Haskell, there's a choice of different implementations of Haxel. Um, so you can go ahead and look at these. Um, mostly these implement the idea behind the applicative instance in Haxel, not necessarily the, uh, the compiler extension that we added, the applicative do extension. Um, so that's something that you really need Haxel to get, or Haskell to get, sorry. So just to summarize what I talked about, you have to write a little bit, bit of boilerplate for your I.O. You have to make your I.O. into a data type, and you have to write a function that implements the I.O. for that data type. But in return, you get quite a lot. Automatic concurrency, caching, uh, ways to do nice testability and debuggability by virtue of the fact that you've just written this bit of boilerplate around your I.O. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Um, so this might be because I'm an HTTP nerd, but how do you invalidate the cache? Well, the cache is per request by default. Um, so there's actually a run haxel function which takes a haxel, and the cache lives for the duration of that. Uh, so in our system, we're, we're running um, quite short-lived requests, and the request uh, throws the cache away at the end of the request, so we don't worry too much about the cache. Uh, blowing up. Um, but this is a question I get asked often. So if you were running Haxel in a, in a situation where you have much longer lived requests or you wanted to uh, have a computation that just lasted much longer, then you would probably have to think about when do I want to flush this cache? You know, what things do I want to remove from it? And it depends very much on how often you expect the, the data ch to change underneath you. How often do you expect the database to change? How long do you want to cache results for? And that sort of thing. So on that then, where does the responsibility lie if you wanted to do that? Is that in the fetch implementation or is it s somewhere else? Uh, that's actually in the, it, it's at a higher level in, in whatever invokes Haxel. So you have a, you define your Haxel computation and then you call a function called run haxel to run it. Um, so it's in the, at the level where you're calling run haxel, you get to choose where to start a new cache or not. All right, it's now time for lunch, so I suggest that you, if you have any more questions, you grab Simon outside. Bye. Thank you.